everyone, and welcome to Fathoms Deep, a Black Sails podcast. From Common Room Radio, I'm Liz Stevens. And I'm Daphne Olive. And we're at episode 409. We're almost there. This is this is the tipping point. This is the, the penultimate yeah. episode. Mm. Yeah. Boy, is it. Uh, first of all, I guess I have to officially say that that whole alternate theory I had, I did, in my defense, uh-huh. say it could be either. Could thing. be. Could be. <laughs> I did say that either they were working together or they weren't, right. which is like my only way I could stand mm. to break my prediction rule, which I guess I shouldn't have broken. I know, right? It's so hard. Totally not working together. <laughs> oh, but that moment when you realize for certain that they were absolutely opposed was just oh, God. heartbreaking. Like I had a physical, emotional response. Yeah, right. No, this is... Um... I think that Luke tweeted that this is his favorite episode. Oh, I'm not surprised at all. It's gorgeous. I think he said that in our interview as well. I meant to go back and listen to what he said I about it. I think right. he did say that. He's beautiful in this. I mean, he oh is my goodness. so yeah. subtle and nuanced and gorgeous. It's beautifully, yeah. beautifully done. It's excellent work. Yes. And yes, I totally understand. And it is. It's uh, even if you never thought that maybe they were working together the heartbreak of this back and yes. forth. And so reminiscent intense. to, was it 309 or 310 when they're around the fire? That's 310, isn't it? 310. Yeah, it yep. was so reminiscent of that episode, which has long been a favorite of mine. And mm-hmm. this one sits side by side with it beautifully. Yeah. Just gorgeous. Yeah. yeah, no, I totally agree. But before we start talking about this, we, mm-hmm. again, I just want to say to our listeners, you all are amazing. Yeah, pretty great. Pretty fantastic. Yeah, it's been an amazing experience to love something and then become a podcaster about it. Thank you, Liz, Mm -hmm. for making that happen. (laughs) And then find this community of people who all love this thing, too, and want to talk about it in the way that we want to talk Mm -hmm. about it. Just, yeah, this kind of deep love where you really want to analyze something, I mean, something like this that so deserves it. and. And it's been so much fun. So I wanted to bring up two really cool things that happened this week. The first one is that Charlotte and Amy emailed us. Yes. Uh-huh. We get such brilliant and insightful emails. We do. Sarah we and do. I were just teasing on Porch Club that the rest of Common Room Radio, we can't even keep up with the emails because we're buried in Fathom's Deep stuff, which is fine. <laughs> it's pretty darn great. <laughs> so thank you, everyone. Seriously, you all email us such interesting mm-hmm. ideas. And uh, this one I wanted to bring up because... It's definitely outside of my of my range of knowledge. It's about Enneagrams, which Liz, you had introduced me to because you started being yes. a little interested in and them. And I want to say that we talked about it on the podcast at some point, didn't we? I think we did. We I did. feel we like did we did. That's so true. Yes. You, it was like right when you discovered yeah. it. And I don't remember it all where that was. I, uh, and you said something you know, about I'm really yeah. not certain at all. I, I, yeah, I'm not certain at all. But I, I didn't give it nearly as much thought as uh, as Charlotte did. So that's quite all right. So yeah, so Charlotte and Amy, they... Um, okay, so I'm going to actually just read something because it's brilliant. Yeah. And they wrote in large part about Flint and Silver. And just for people who don't... Just look up Enneagram so you get a general sense. But there are numbers that relate to different... Uh, types of personalities, but the numbers all relate to each other as well when people are being healthy or unhealthy right. or are attracted to certain other types of numbers. And it's it's not correct to say that it's anything like Myers-Briggs, but if you're familiar with Myers-Briggs, yeah. it's also kind of a classification Right, like a system. temperament sorter. Mm-hmm. Right, right, exactly. So I'm just going to read some of this because not only do I love it, but I think it really relates to this episode in particular. The timing was really great. They didn't know this because they hadn't seen this episode, uh-huh. but the timing is fantastic. So, so Flint is a classic number one Enneagram. His driving desire is to be good and right. His driving fear is of being wrong. At his best, he is moral, upright, and sure. At his worst, he is scary and judgmental and maniacally dedicated to his own worldview. We've seen both Flints. Uh, They think that Silver is a seven. His driving desire is to avoid pain. His driving fear is being trapped. At his best, he's charismatic and flexible and inventive. At his worst, avoidant loner who runs away from things that don't make him happy. They think that we've also seen both sides of of silver. Mm -hmm. I agree. But the really cool thing they said is that ones and sevens move toward each other. Ones move toward seven in growth. Mm -hmm. So that when Flint is healthy, 
he starts to take on some of John Silver's better qualities, levity, charisma, inventiveness, adaptability. Sevens move towards one in stress, which means that John Silver, as he gets unhealthy, will take on some of Flint's worst elements, his rigidity and isolationism, thinking he knows better, his darkness as it were. I love this. No, really I mean, fantastic. I just feel like this is exactly what both of them have demonstrated mm-hmm. throughout the show, but particularly in this episode. I mean, this is fascinating. And then the last part that they said is about Maddie. Oh, uh-huh, yes. They believe that Maddie is also a one, mm-hmm. which makes a lot of sense. We've seen such similarities right. between her and the better side of, of Flint. Course. So they said that she's a one, but she's a healthy, she's healthy. one. Mm-hmm. So she has all of the morality minus the rigidity. Mm-hmm. And I totally agree. And I love this. And and this is a great argument for also how Silver is kind of bound between them, but choosing Maddie, yes. like choosing the healthier one, healthier number one, uh-huh. according to Enneagrams, sure. over, over the less healthy one. I just think this is really interesting mm-hmm. and a, just a really neat food for thought, especially here yes <laughs> when we absolutely. See, when we see when we see the conflict okay. okay and then the other thing i love that happened this week was uh rival piper or at rival piper on twitter brought up that woods rogers ship is the eurydice yes now tell me about that because you you know text messaged me in all caps with several exclamation points about this <laughs> and i did not know what it meant and rather than look it up on wikipedia i thought that i would have you tell me the story on the podcast for anyone else who was like yeah okay I'm so amused because you and I miss it, but uh, well, but that's so funny is this this slip through the cracks because you're interested in the ships. You notice ship names. I think in the last episode you even said, "What a great ship name!" And I was like, "Hi, I wonder what it was." You know ship names. You've noticed ship names. I noticed Greek mythology, Uh but not necessarily the ship names. So this one (laughs) just missed both of us somehow. We should have both caught it, and yet we both missed it. I don't know what happened. I love it. I'm I'm so amused by this. But yeah, so it is she noted that it's the Eurydice. The story in short of Eurydice yeah. is that she was the wife of Orpheus, who in oh. in Greek mythology was like a legendary musician. Uh-huh. And she died. Okay. And he went into Hades to basically ask for her back. And he charmed Hades through his music into agreeing to let oh. her go leave Hades yes. uh-huh. but the agreement was that he had to walk in front of her and not look back the whole way until they're outside of Hades mm. and in his excitement and his nervousness about yes. it he he went over the threshold and then thinking they had they were done he looked back oh, no. and she had to stay oh god yeah. Okay. I know. It's like, right? Yeah. It's a really haunt. It's a haunting story. Uh-huh. Go figure. <laughs> yeah. Yay, Greek mythology. Mm. So, what's fascinating about this, and again, just I love our community. Like, so we had people associating this with different things. From rival Piper, Orpheus was supposed to have faith in the rules of the deal applying to silver. He's supposed to have faith in Flint, perhaps. Rival Piper basically associated this with, with silver and Madi, saying that silver is trying to save Madi and sure. that there's potential in that he that because also because of his anxiety about the situation oh, he might be slipping up sure which we certainly so that's see one way to look that at that's at least how Flint sees it in this episode uh-huh. exactly exactly that's, that's definitely how Flint sees it mm-hmm. and then hearts of flame also on twitter said and this is so cool on many levels and made me want to look up all the ship names for this whole show for the whole four seasons and I didn't uh-huh but I might have to do that later on and do something about it. She says that the Eurydice has to do with Rogers and Eleanor oh. because Eleanor is dead. And as we see in this episode oh, is haunting yes, Rogers. Yes. Oh, I can't wait to talk about that. Uh-huh. But even cooler than that, Rogers, different ship names at different times or different ships at different times relate to his state of being that at first he sails the excuse me everyone if i pronounce this incorrectly um the delicia which in spanish means delicious and in portuguese i believe means just like wonderful or maybe wonderful in relation to food Uh so you know back when you and i thought that rogers was you know kind of delicious himself (laughs) okay 
I feel like they back might be in a season three. But okay, sure. <laughs> oh, Liz, go listen to yourself no, in season no, three. No, <laughs> I didn't say that. I didn't think he was wonderful. I just said that the ship name being that this guy is delicious might be a little bit of a stretch. But yes. Wait okay, a minute. Okay. Well, or or something wonderful. Or something wonderful. Okay. And then she said. When he takes the man of war from Teach, that's when he's becoming a man of war in the story. Oh. And he goes to Havana. Sure. Okay. Okay. And third, now he's on the Eurydice when he's chasing after the ghost of his yeah. wife. Yeah. No, that's good. I like that. Isn't that, that great? That I know. Love it. So I told John Steinberg how cool this whole thing is, this whole discussion about the Eurydice. And he said... That one is fun. The parallels are upside down. Rogers is both Orpheus trying to communicate or make peace with Eleanor mm. and at the same time holding on to Silver's Eurydice. Oh, yes. So, in fact, it's the best thing ever because it actually yeah. illuminates both storylines at the same time, which is amazing. I went from being like kind of in love with like in shock that we missed it sure. kind of in love with it to now like just full on crazy in beautiful. love with it and uh, uh either sorry everyone or you're welcome everyone i think i might have to go down this rabbit hole and just like look at all the ship names and how they relate uh -huh. oh uh -huh. i have one hornigold ship in season three uh -huh. the orion which is the hunter oh that's so good yeah so mm -hmm. so now i'm thinking yeah still don't I mean, understand okay. the walrus but okay well, they couldn't choose the walrus because they didn't choose the walrus because the walrus was preset for them as the ship of Flint. <laughs> so some of them, also the Queen Anne's Revenge. I yeah. mean, that was. I mean, I guess they could have chosen to give yeah, Teach a different, they just have to. a different one, right? Um, right. The Ranger was already the Ranger. The Queen Anne's Revenge was already. <laughs> I love. I love all this. Okay, That's fantastic. Uh, yeah. Okay, and that was your episode of Daphne is a total geek. <laughs> All right. And the last announcement is that we are going to do another round of Hamill oh, sales. Yes. <laughs> that would be enough. And I did a very informal poll in my own Twitter. Lovely. Okay. Of whether whether we should include the Hamilton mixtape. And since I kind of wanted to anyway, and a lot of people said they wanted that, then. <laughs> sure. Okay. So we are going to use the mixtape as well. Um, you know, my thought was that we would focus on season four, but I have a feeling we have a lot of people who uh, who maybe never didn't get to do Hamill sales, like weren't with yeah. us back when we did Hamill sales before. Uh, so what we do with this game, and I'll tweet the, this is a Twitter game. Yep. So another reminder, if you're not on Twitter, just go it's do that thing. Fun. Yep. We are at Black Sales Cast, hashtag Fathoms Deep. So much fun happening. So many discussions yes. happening there. It's really a lot. It's great. And with Hamill sales, what we do is we take lyrics from Hamilton, or I guess the mixtape now, and combine them with images or GIFs from Black sales that have a similar idea or are funny right. or just make yep, you happy. It's just a mashup. So, so it's and fun. Mm -hmm. yep, yeah, exactly. And use the hashtag Hamill sales, yep. and we had a blast with it last yeah. time. So whatever, yeah. check out the focus last on one season for four. Inspiration. Yeah, absolutely. Go go look at that hashtag. There were hundreds yes, of them. Yes, and they were them. so much fun. And they're, yes, yeah, so much fun. So yeah. So let's start on Monday, the day, well, the day that this drops, basically. Mm -hmm. We'll start our Hamill sales. And let's do it, I don't know, for like a week and a half-ish, because I think we definitely will want to do it for the finale as definitely, well. So we'll sure. do it for some amount of time after the finale. And my thinking is this will help us a little bit with something <laughs> black sales related we could do after the grief yeah, of the sure, end. Yeah, sure, sure. Of the grief, possibly, of the end itself mm -hmm. and the grief of the fact that Black Sails will be done. Yeah. The story will have been told. Mm -hmm. Ah, wow. So, yeah. So, yes. So, join us for Hamill Sales. I will tweet uh, instructions mm -hmm. soon in the Fathoms Deep uh, account. Excellent. Sail! So, yeah, Liz, uh, guess what? What? We're going to do chronological again. Cause... Praise God, because it's way the easier right. way to do this. Okay. For me yeah. personally. No, and, excellent. No, and we, we have to. I mean, this is oh, like no. 310 it that is. we have flashbacks. Yeah. Then they all, oh, God, the composition of the yes. present time and the past yes. and the lighting difference. Yes. I, mean, I just love the filter. Uh -huh. on Whatever the, the grayscale is and the music, the change in the music. And Absolutely. I love the music from the past scenes. We're beautiful. I also felt... Do you think, uh, just from a narrative perspective, 
it seemed to me as though the flashbacks for the memory, like when we had the flashbacks of the fire, it -hmm. seemed like we were just uh, like anything else. Like we were just observers, like we were watching. Right. However, because of the grayscale and because of a sense of maybe lyricism to the dialogue, it felt much more subjective. Like this was Silver's memory of what had happened and not the reality of what had happened. Yes. I I totally agree. Mm. Yes. I completely agree. Right. And I think I feel like I just remembered Tennessee Williams. It reminds me of uh, Glass Menagerie when he says this is a memory play. And as such, it is dimly lit. And that explains the fiddle in the wings. Oh, oh, my goodness. Wow. Okay. That almost seems like <laughs> that could have been an inspiration for could've how been. they did this. Could have been. Yeah, because the lighting was very different and the right. music had changed quite a lot and had, yeah, that sense of, of, of subjectivity, of being, of being memory. Right. Yeah, I thought it was beautiful. Right. Yes. No, I, and I think it's very important. I think it's very important that it felt like it was Silver's point of view and Silver's memories mm-hmm. because Silver's the one who's making choices here. In the yes. in the present time part, like Flint, I mean Flint's making strategic choices, but the the dilemma here is is Silver's dilemma. Right, we're in Silver's point of view, absolutely. Right, mm-hmm. no, but even in the present, to some extent, because even the, I mean we move around like we do all the time, but but the question here of what the person who has a question about what they're going to do and how they're going to do it is Silver. Okay, sure, a question. Fl- you know what I mean, Flint? Sh- strategy, right, Flint. Sure. Exactly. Flint knows what he wants to do and knows what should happen. Right. And I, again, we can discuss this. I don't think there's a moment here where Flint's feelings towards Silver change in this episode. No. The person who's struggling with their feelings about the other person is yes. Silver. Yes. And so that's why the memories are so appropriately Silver's memories mm-hmm. because, because we, even when we're not in his point of view in the present like really this episode is about silver's shift or or a shift that's been happening but this is i feel like this episode to a large extent explains what has been going on with silver Mm. like you know like i i've to be honest you know i've had a a bit of a hard time sometimes with with what's going on in silver's mind like i understand i understand that he's desperate to save maddie obviously but he made a choice not to work with Flint. And so this is, I feel like, part of that storytelling that we needed a little bit of the interior of his mind. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if this answers it, but I just felt like it helped me with a glimpse. And I, yeah. I hope, I mean, it's interesting. I'm curious where we'll end at the end of our, our, our episode about what Silver's state of mind yeah. is. Yeah, And it makes me curious, too, about the finale, if that's going to, if we're going to stay in the perspective of Silver, or if we're going to move into Flint's, or if we're going to see them as the two-headed coin that they are. Yep, well, we'll find out. <laughs> All right, so now let's get into, let's get into this episode and the, and the scene by scene, because we're doing chronological. Okay, let's do it. All right. So, yeah, we start in that in our past tense, in our in our again, it's it's like I almost don't want to call them flashbacks because because they do feel like memories. Well, let's call them memories then. Yeah. Okay. Let's say in the memory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So we start in one of our memory scenes. Which is just beautiful, right? I mean, I know we just (sighs) said that, but I feel like it has to be said again. Um, yeah, I think we're just going to say this over and over again because it is so stunning. Well, and not only visually, but like their love and their trust for one another is so richly communicated here. Yes. And and also the foreshadowing of you'll be teaching me how to defeat you. Mm, I know. This is an episode that's harder to watch the second time oh, than the first that. time. And then, and of course, well, I'm going into it, of course, I don't know whether or not right. for sure they're actually opposed in this moment. So right. it made it that much more heartbreaking just a, a scene later when we realized that they absolutely are head to head. Right. Well, and I love that the from the first minute, almost like from their first interaction, I feel like the whole stage is set for what's going to be important mm-hmm. here. So can I just point out the the few, the three lines, basically, or it's not two lines and a reaction yeah. that I feel like really set up the whole memory portion of it. So, uh, so Flint's looking out and, you know, and Silver's like, what are you looking at? And he says, can't you see it? 
He says, I'm looking at NASA. Yes. Can't you see it? Mm -hmm. And then Silver's like, he's like, are you fucking serious? Which is, you Don't know. Don't tell me I climbed this hill for this. Uh-huh. Right. Oh, exactly. That's so good. So I love that. So we have the dreamer and the pragmatist mm -hmm. right there mm -hmm. laid out from the very beginning of this. Mm -hmm. And this has always been, you know, this has always been a theme in Black Sails right. of dreamers and pragmatists. Mm -hmm. And this has always been a thing between them. Right. Yeah. Although we always saw this as something that was something that made them stronger as a team. Mm. If you have a dreamer, if you have, what is it that Silver says? You need two people to run a crew. You need someone to tell them what they need to do and someone else to tell them why they want to do yeah. it. Yeah. Well, I was Remember thinking when he's too that of to the Billy? last thing that they were kind of, w w when they were having that beautiful fight on the ship, when he said, you know, mm -hmm. I followed you just because you said I know the way. So that looking out yep. across the water and he, he doesn't see it, but the, but the trust right. is there. Yeah. No, right. Well, beautiful. and the context of this is it's a few weeks before right. the beginning of episode one. <sighs> God, it kills no, me. Sorry, gorgeous. I'm just like, I'm going to have to just not cry during this episode. <laughs> so what I love is that when Silver gives him shit, Flint laughs. Like, have we ever seen Flint like this yeah. happy looking? I mean, oh, I, mean I don't know other, what other, other than happy. in London. I don't even know if I would even call it a laugh. It was a chuckle. And yes. Well, what's up to his chuckle, though? But that's like for Flint. Yeah, you're that's right. Like, you're that's some right. serious <laughs> levity. Yes. Fair. <laughs> no, and it's not levity with pretense. I mean, sure, I always use the gif of Flint laughing when he's talking to Gates right before he kills Gates. Yeah. But that was total. That was theater. I mean, it, he like they went back and forth. But I do believe that in large part that that conversation for Flint was mostly theater because when Gates started getting nostalgic, Flint got super serious. Yeah. But this was just a moment of like, you know, Flint doing his Flint thing and Silver doing his Silver thing mm -hmm. and Flint being kind of amused. Yeah. Like, yep, that's who we are. That chuckle, chuckle. And I just like, that's it. This is how these memories are going to play out, mm -hmm. basically. So, yeah, I love that. OK. And then the whole thing with the crutch and him taking his leg off. Yeah. That flint said you know you're going to be more nimble on the crutch and then he starts to like say well i know this is hard for you and then he pauses because silver didn't hesitate, no hesitation. To take off uh -uh. the leg in front of him he said i think we're past that with the pride yeah mm -hmm. exactly i know <laughs> i know it's it's funny if you didn't see the last episode, like if you just dropped in on this episode mm -hmm. in the middle of nowhere, you'd be like, oh, look at these lovely friends. Aren't they right? so great together? Uh -huh. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, and then Silver says the thing. He says, you, you say you're teaching me to fight, but every man fights differently. Mm -hmm. Aren't you really teaching me to defeat you? Yes. And then again, Flint's just, he's joking around. He's like, ah, I'll take my chances. Right. Oh, God. Yeah. No, it's heartbreaking. And, and I beautiful. love this because this is actually like, I just always will see stuff in relation to the end of season three. Mm -hmm. Like this is actually now the closest timeline wise to the end of season three to 310 to mm -hmm. that fireside chat. Yeah, sure. You see what I'm saying? So this, pre because this predates 401, this shows that moment. Like remember, remember that thing you always say about how you wish you saw characters just hanging yes. out? Uh-huh. You, you kind of got that. that, yeah. And you're right. This is right on the heels of that conversation where Flint right. did expose his true self and his identity. Exactly. And his backstory. Right. Mm. So you, yeah. I just, I really love that this is filling in between that conversation and the conversation about the twins in the beginning of 401. Yeah. I, I feel like this, these parts really filled that in beautifully for me. Mm -hmm. Like explaining, I, I just, again, Going back to the beginning of season four now, yes. having seen these memories mm -hmm. is going to be very meaningful, I think, because I think it's going to give us a lot of context for questions that we had along the way, yeah. especially about Flint. I mean, again, this isn't Flint's point of view, but still, I feel like a lot of the stuff we said, well, maybe Flint's being like this because of Silver, maybe, you know, because of the relationship. And I just feel like this really gives that some richness mm -hmm. gives it a little like a little texture and depth yes. to to what we see in flint throughout this he's very relaxed he's very trusting mm -hmm. here it's very beautiful yeah. i'm like temporarily really happy for for james it starts out so <laughs> lovely no i know <laughs> uh okay so then um uh it's right so then for like beautiful 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 chuckles trusting mm -hmm. whatever and then 
we're back on Skeleton Island yes. and we're reminded that Silver's actually with hands now and not with Flint. Yes. And oh, right. Remember that thing where things are all falling apart? Let's, let's go back there now. Mm hmm. <laughs> They, they, yeah, they're entering the island. But the thing that Silver says, which is interesting to me, is that he he says that he knows the governor is probably trying to make some sort of move. He recognizes that, you know, I mean, he says we need to be fast because the governor's making a move. But he already knows, like, I'm going to bring this up right. later on. He already he already recognizes that there's some serious danger in all of Absolutely. this. OK, and then we see Rogers and Billy on the deck mm -hmm. rogers okay, and is look at luke roberts is just doing such wonderful work he looks so haunted yeah yeah absolutely and it's interesting is. because that's the word i thought of before we actually saw the vision of eleanor is that he was looking oh. haunted. oh that's mm. so interesting yeah he yeah you're right he looks he looks like a man who hasn't slept yes. who is right tormented yes absolutely mm -hmm. no that's totally true um, so yeah, so he's asking Billy about strategy. And the thing that's interesting to me in this scene is, you know, he asks who will prevail and Billy's like, again, Billy's telling him stories like Billy's like, well, Silver has this, but Flint's very resilient and all of this. And he's like, but really, so really all I'm telling you is that whatever, you know, this, this other thing you should do, you should do it now. Mm-hmm. I am I'm just kind of horrified. I mean, I'm horrified by Billy in this whole episode, but I feel like this, I mean, we don't know if Billy came up with the plan, but he's definitely pushing Rogers yeah. to get on that as soon as possible, yeah. which is probably smart for Rogers. But uh, the fact that Billy is the one who's like, yeah, get it's like the catalyst. Yeah. The get moving on that thing. That's going to kill all of my brothers or my former brothers, whatever is just really hard to watch. It is. It's hard to watch Billy be that. Pr I mean, it's not as hard as watching him in a little bit when he's actually shooting them, but it's still, it's super hard. Yeah, it's, it, it is hard. It almost feels like a character break just because we don't see, if it wasn't for the, him staying his hand with Ben Gunn, I think I needed that as a viewer, as someone who has always loved Billy so much too, to at right. least see exactly. him. Uh, seeing this be difficult for him, seeing him hesitate, I mean, mm -hmm. because, like, I know that you're upset, Billy. I realize what was done to you, but God, this is a big but change. Damn. This is a yeah. full turnaround. Yep. But, you know, I think my defense for this being the way it happens with Billy is, I mean, it's not, we know that he did become less moral. Yes. Right? That we saw all through season four. Mm -hmm. So, like, but, but right, but we had argued and, you know, we talked with Tom about that his morality was very specific to his people. Mm -hmm. But I think Billy has been more than many characters, a person who sees things in black and white, yeah. not in gradations. Yes. And so a person like that, when they snap, they often will go completely to the opposite mm, side yeah you know it's it's almost like he's in the wrong story like this is a story full of tragic heroes oh sure who have all these complications who live in the gray area sure right exactly and he's like a different kind of hero yes. he's he's the hero who like where every or he's all good yeah. and so like so it almost seems like the only other option for him is all bad is to go all bad oh yeah <laughs> Sure. <laughs> so I think that's why it works for me because it was it always has been a little bit like he was in the wrong story. Yes, yes, that makes sense. <laughs> um, okay, and then Roger says that he wants to talk to Maddie again, but we're not there yet. But uh, but again, did you see how everyone reacted to him? Like how I forget. Oh shoot, I meant to look up the name of that soldier, the soldier who was with Eleanor in the fort. Yes, who I'm just really liking. McCansom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That is his name. <laughs> somebody called him something. I don't remember what it was. It was like that. <laughs> right. In the somebody feed. did. Was, somebody. Yeah. Yes, correct me. It was some... something like that. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally Lieutenant true. Lieutenant McCotty something. I don't remember. But yeah. Right. Right. And remember, wait, did he work? No, he wasn't work. He wasn't with Eleanor when Eleanor, like he wasn't one of the soldiers who worked with Flint. Was he against the Spanish? Because that would make him no. super conflicted. No, because no, he, he was came with Rogers. With then. Rogers and he, he watched Rogers okay. as he discovered the body. Right. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. Okay, so he has been with Rogers, but um, but yeah, but he's when Rogers is like, bring her above. I need to talk to her. He totally gave him a look like, are you serious, dude? Yeah. 
yeah, they're all losing patience. <laughs> I mean, they're going to follow him. Yeah, they're clearly well, that's doing what his, his bidding. But said like the last episode, the people right. are having trouble following you now. Yes, right, they're right. Losing faith in you. Mm. Exactly. So next we have. Oh, right. This is the beginning of the heartbreak for me personally. We have in the jungle. Uh, Silver and Hands find the men who have been trying to track Flint. Mm -hmm. And Silver tells them to go, like, there's two trails. And he's like, okay, you all go there, you go there. And Hans says to him, Flint probably wants you to separate right. them. You've sent one of those groups probably to their death. Mm -hmm. And Silver says, as long as they expose his position. Mm -hmm. Yep. Where, 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 where did our guy who, like, <laughs> who will do anything right? to save his crew members go? <laughs> And Han says that. He says, I wonder if he knows how much you've learned from him. Mm. Again, back to the Enneagrams, like Silver, when he's in stress, sure. is kind of becoming more Flint-like mm -hmm. in the ways that we don't like. Right. <laughs> <laughs> bad Flint. Yes. Again, we've... Right, bad, bad Flint. <laughs> um, I mean, we've talked about this a lot of times, that part of being a leader is making hard choices, and part of those hard choices have to do you know you sacrifice men for the larger cause but i just want to remind everyone again i'm not criticizing silver exactly i understand his motivation he wants to save the woman he loves but the larger cause here is his mm -hmm. he's sacrificing his men for his own purposes here he's not doing this for the cause right. he's not doing this for the larger war to you know he's in danger he's endangering yeah oh and maddie would be so pissed which again, Flint knows. We're going to hear from Maddie very soon. Yes, we are. <laughs> about God, her I love perspective her too. about stuff. Damn, I love that woman. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is a huge difference that uh, this isn't like Flint saying, you know, we need to starve some of the men so that we have a few men in the doldrums who can still move the ship. You know, right. that's that's pragmatic. That's sacrificing men for the sake of the of the whole right. of saying, you know, Silver, he, he's he's sacrificing men for his own goals right. oh god mm -hmm. which again i understand him for doing it but we have to keep that in perspective right. and then we go straight back to his memories like straight from how much you learn from flint to flint teaching him right oh and i love the the quote from this one where flint says you have to think who was my opponent yesterday and who is he mm -hmm. today and I love even before that, I, I just love I still I still haven't quite figured out what I want to say about this. But I just have to talk about when he's talking specifically about the blade before he says that. Oh, the he wrist says, and the, and the, the end. wrist. Uh -huh. Yeah, that the wrist is the past tense from which it cannot separate itself. Uh -huh. And the blade is the present tense, which also cannot be denied. I meant to come up with really big thoughts about mm -hmm. that. Mostly, I just love it. I mean, well, I mean, I think it segues us into the idea of the storytelling when he talks about, uh, yes. it, yeah, and about your past and your backstory being important yeah. and being a part of your motivation, and you cannot separate it from what your present self is doing. At least, uh, right. At least from Flint's perspective. Right. Which, and also, if I can step outside the story for a moment, clearly from the perspective sure. of our Black Sales creators, storytellers. So Flint's the one who's right here, <laughs> not Silver, who's saying that it's irrelevant. Well, uh, yeah, it's interesting. Yes, no, that's totally true. And and this is an interesting thing because we are both talking about storytellers. Mm -hmm. Like we know that both of these people know how to tell a story. So this is an interesting break suddenly right. that Flint, when Flint re realizes the moment that it just now occurred to him that he had always thought he was going to get Silver's story, but he never actually did. Or he always thought, if Silver, what, what, what he said, if you were worth if you're knowing. If you were worth knowing, yeah. <laughs> oh, James, I love you. You, you, and, your, you and yourself. <laughs> and the way, the way you are. <laughs> um, I also like that when he's describing the, how this relates to to the actual sword play, he says the thing about the wrist and the blade, and he says, but you're looking into my eyes still. Yes. And that's how you get yourself killed. Oh. Uh -huh. And then Silver says, how does one watch two points at the same time? And this also seems to me like a difference between them, because Silver 
has always like his greatest strength as a strategist has been his reading of people. Right. Yeah, sure. He's looking into Flint's eyes. He's always has been based. Yes, exactly. (laughs) He was staring into Flint the whole time. (laughs) <laughs> um so yeah that i just i really liked that 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 he he basically said the strategies you've always used and have been useful yeah. to you of reading the person are not going to help you stay alive in a battle interesting yes yes and so he's giving him new tools basically mm, yeah i like that and then and then Silver says, how can you, what, is, what I just said it, but I'm going to say it. How does one watch two points at the same time? And this is, I think, was it last episode where I said that like Flint still, like Silver has so many skills, but Flint's really the strategist. Yes. Yes. And that's yes. what he's and teaching Silver him. As still much more as he's teaching mm-hmm. Right. And what he's teaching him in large is not just actual swordplay, but warfare. He yes. says in warfare. Yes. And this is a thing that Flint has always had is is like truly the the big picture. Mm. Like part of being a big picture person is the dreaming and the, you know, the revolutionary thing. But also to be a leader of men on that level, you have to be able to look at all of the points at the same time. Mm. You can't miss any. And so that's I feel like part of what he's teaching Silver right. also that Silver has always been used his skills as a relational person Mm -hmm. and flint has a little bit like they each they share skills like silver can do some strategy but it's always been about reading people Mm -hmm. flint can read people but for him it's always been about strategy yeah so no i like that very much yes he's letting silver into his way of defeating an opponent right and as we've said before and it's funny that this did come us also in the enneagrams as we've said before silver was has always been the person who's really fast learner and good at integrating other people's skills and traits Mm -hmm. into his own being. Mm -hmm. And so I just feel like, yeah, we're just kind of watching that process happen. I like that very much. So then, uh, so right. When, when, when Flint brings up that he doesn't know Silver's past, Silver starts telling the story that we all know. Mm -hmm. And Flint's like, yeah, but you know, that's not actually true. true. Right. Yeah. Even though Silver is saying that his past is irrelevant, mm-hmm. this really harkens back to, to like in fairy tales, which we've talked about before, that no, knowing someone's story is like yeah. knowing their name. It gives you a yep. power over them. And I think that Flint is absolutely right to be bothered by it. And I think that Silver knows that. Yes, I do too. And right. And we've talked about that. We talked about that with Silver with hands, that knowing his, yes, that that's Silver right. knowing that's hands story yes. was kind of what activated him right. as, as someone being loyal to Silver. And we even talked about that. The fact that Silver didn't have a backstory and that he was the only one of the major characters at mm-hmm. this point, that we didn't know anything about his past really. Right. I mean, sure, you know, home for boys, Solomon right. Little. This is what mm-hmm. we know. But we know that he used the name Solomon Little in multiple situations. Therefore, you know, exactly like Flint said, like I heard, I overheard you using elements of this story. So I know it's not true. And, and Silver says it's not important. And Flint says, well, we know that's not true either. And then Flint goes into it again. We now, we know that this is pretty soon after Flint did tell that story of himself. And he says, not only do you know my story and how it motivates me, but you insinuated yourself into that story yes. in a way that if we came to blows, I would hesitate. Which is lovely foreshadowing. It is. Oh, God. Uh, yes. Mm-hmm. Lovely, terrifying, heartbreaking. And again, he says he's not angry. Like, I I believe Flint in this moment. Like, he's he's disturbed. Right. He's bothered but not and concerned. Angry. But not angry. Yeah. Right. He doesn't. I don't think he feels like even though he said that, I don't feel like he feels threatened by Silver here. Right. He's hurt yes. more than threatened. Uh, yeah. And I don't even know that I would go so well. No, I suppose that's the closest word. Yeah. It, that, that he's hurt by it. Yes. Well, or that he would be honored by the reciprocation. Yeah. Absolutely. And and it's upsetting to Silver. Yes. I mean, I really... Upsetting to Flint, you mean, or to Silver? No, it's upsetting to F- Silver. Like, he leaves then. Oh, and yeah. And he's like, he, he seems, you know, honestly upset also. Like, well, this he is... says, I don't want to tell it, right? I don't want to tell my story. Is that basically what he says? Uh, I... 
I'm not. I think that's in the next one. Yeah, I think that's in the next bit he does. Like S- Flint says all this stuff about Silver knowing his story, and and then Silver just leaves. And he's like, "We need to continue tomorrow." Right, but we'll he's, tomorrow. you know, he seems, mm-hmm. yeah, he seems a bit broken up about it too. Right. Like he's not leaving angry. He's not, you know sure. what I mean? Like this is that. I mean, that's what I'm loving overall. And we'll get into the de- the next the next bit of memory is where they really get into it, but. What I find so moving here is how upsetting all of this is for Silver as well. Yeah. So next, uh, we're back in back in the jungle. I don't know if it's a forest or jungle. I'm going to call it jungle. We'll call it because, a jungle. Yeah, because we're in the Caribbean. It's tropical. Yeah, sure, sure. So next we have in the jungle, like, I don't know. Uh, you tell me if you, how much you need to talk about the fighting and stuff. I know this is not my thing so much. Uh, but... No, the only thing so I wanted has... to say about the jungle scene is that I regret not saying this last week when I saw them send the six guys out into the jungle. And I was like, who are those guys? What's with the red shirts? Are they just going to be fodder for Flint later? <laughs> yep. Well, except yes, one, they are. Except one of them's Joji. No, no, totally. There was Joji and Hans. So no, there were the two guys right. that we knew. Yeah. And then mm-hmm. three guys right. that we've never seen before. And then one more who at least looked familiar, right? Or was the other one was Dooley. Right. Dooley. Yes. No, because Dooley went with Flint. No, Dooley's with, yeah. So is it four guys um, we don't know, plus Joji and Hans? Yeah, we, yes. I think that's right. Yes. Anyway. Yes. Fodder. Fodder uh, for the blade is all I'm saying. Mm, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, basically, we have, like, Flint being super smart and outsmarting the three guys and uh, fighting. Yep. As it's usual. the next fight that I need to talk about, right. not this the one. The next fight's so more important. Yeah. This one, interesting, brutal, <laughs> because, good. I love yeah. that Flint is like a specter in the woods. Pretty cool. I know. We're, yeah. Be prepared. <laughs> Get get ready. We're gonna have to raise a few glasses during this episode mm-hmm. very soon. Indeed. Starting very soon. Okay, but next we have Jack. We have Jack and our old dude, who I'm sure has a name, but I've just been calling him old dude. I love who this I though. Love. Yes, his voice is amazing. First of all, I yes. need audiobooks from this guy, please. And oh my this God, little story of the painting of the sea. This is yep. beautiful dialogue, and I love that we watch Jack just being entranced by it like he's enchanted by this idea which is pretty lovely and very true to character and of course toby schmidt's just nailing it as always right well and also this inspired him i mean it's interesting i feel like this story is actually yeah it's neat because this isn't exactly what he came for he didn't really come exactly to preserve the account but you know that's what he loves. I mean, the the, oh, the right. lore of pirates, the recognition of this old pirate from the old piracy. Yes, yes. And he's not, he's not one of the giants. He mm-hmm. sailed with a giant, but he's not a giant. And yet, I think this recognition from him moved Jack possibly more than any interaction he's had with any of the old school pirates. Like this, this possibly subtle so. recognition... Wow. Right? Mm-hmm, sure. He tells him the story about walking away and having the sea become a painting. But this guy is really moved by yes. Jack. He said, you know, he's he recognizes the things they have done. Mm-hmm. Like basically you you youngsters have done good stuff. Right. Uh-huh. And then he says, "So if this thing happens, if I take you to this place, does this mean that you will preserve the right. account?" And right. that's when Jack says that and more. When he says, uh, and then, hold on to this for as long as you can for all of us who once had it and walked away. Oh, God. Right. I moved. I want to do what Jack's doing I, now yeah. after that guy well, said it's, that, it's, right? It, and it covers so many things because it's also about, you know, the revolution um, and everything yeah. that, that Flint is fighting for as well. No, it's, yeah, yeah it's yeah. beautiful. Yeah, it's, it is really, really beautiful. And it's so interesting. I love Jack going from at the beginning of this conversation, like, not trusting not not trusting this guy but like not quite believing in this guy he comes into it a little skeptical Mm -hmm. or a lot skeptical of this old dude and he leaves it so inspired and i was just like you know what he just got recognition from a proper pirate Mm -hmm. yeah you're right and and recognition you know i don't know i I, i'm trying to get the words for what i'm trying to say here like I feel like for the first time, someone actually is recognizing what Jack's doing. Sure. Mm-hmm. Like not, well, you know what I mean? Like, him, I think. Yes. Right. But it's just like, uh, Jack has tried a lot of things. Yeah. yeah. He's tried to impress a lot of people. <laughs> uh-huh. Our dear boy. And th- yeah. And this is a plan that stems, like he said to Grandma Guthrie, like, I'm a different sort of pirate. This is a plan that stems specifically, I mean, of course, 
it is in large part also Max's plan. Oh, but sure. But this stems from this the skill set that Jack has and this beautiful coalition that now he has had again with Max that he used to have. And the idea that a proper pirate is recognizing this thing that really only Jack could conceive of. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is this is outside of the skill set really of Flint, obviously, because Jack's trying to create something different. Right. He's not trying to do a revolution. He's trying to create the thing that Max always said, the fighting from within, yeah. like something that's this weird, wonderful blending of the tools of civilization, but freedom right. at the right. same time. Um, so yeah, I just, yeah, I really love it. I really, I really, yeah, <laughs> I, I was very moved by the scene, if you could tell. <laughs> All right. And then we move on to someone with completely different set of goals or two people with very different sets of goals. Um, we have the scene with Woods Rogers and Maddie. Oh, yes, we sure do. Well, and I love... And Eleanor's ghost. And Eleanor's ghost. Okay. And first of all, I did not, uh, or right, when I first saw the embroidery in the background, it took me just a second because I was thinking, did Mrs. Hudson? Come I think it's along? actually knitting. It's got to it be knitting, knitting not embroidery. Nick, there was the sound of the knitting. It was so fuzzy yes, that at exactly. first I, I thought that it was embroidery. Also, I was between you and me, I was having some streaming issues too. So <laughs> I was oh. like, why is it getting blurry? Anyway, uh, no, it was blurry, blurry on purpose, yes. and I think it had to be knitting, even though we hadn't seen Eleanor knitting. Right. It had to be knitting because we needed the sound, which, oh my God, if there's ever been a sound effect that I've loved in this show, it's this one. Yeah, pretty great. Mm -hmm. When I did realize, though, that that was Eleanor, I was so moved. Mm -hmm. uh, Because, of course, I always loved everything with um, Flint's dreams of Miranda. So this was was really, really gorgeous. Um, And I was so happy that uh, when he first said the man responsible for the death of my wife, I was like, oh, he's narrativizing now. How can he, how can he be doing this? He must know. And when Maddie just straight up calls him out on that, God, she's such a queen and I love her. I know. I know. I do too. Well, and I love that he says, what compromise can there be with the man responsible for the death of my wife? It's like he's talking to himself. Yeah. Like, how would I ever compromise with myself? Oh, God. Uh-huh. Yeah. Wow. Yes. Okay, but first, before that, we have to talk about the first thing he says. Cause sure. I really need to talk about this. Okay. The first thing he says is, you have no idea the restraint this yes. takes. The instinct to violence from, you know, and he's talking about what you destroyed and you taken from me. And I would like to quote Maddie now. Uh-huh. Please, forever. When she Always. said. Tattooed when, on my body. When. <laughs> Yeah, I know. That's that's it. Liz's love language is for me to quote Maddie. Mm. Happy to do it anytime, <laughs> darling. He has no idea who he's talking to, mm-hmm. and I just want to bring up the scene in I should know which episode I'm talking about. Three oh nine or three oh eight or yes, three oh eight. Sorry, in three oh eight, the whole thing with where Dobbs attacked. Uh, one of Maddie's yes, men, yes, uh-huh. the knife scene, and then the scene on the poop deck, because I know it's a poop deck now. Thank you, Lucas Thank Edlund. Thank you, Lucas Edlund. Yeah. Although and, which means I have to say way poop more deck fun to now. say poop deck makes you feel exactly. kind of like a 12-year-old, but okay. A little bit, a little bit. But um, so up by the railing, let's say uh-huh. that, at the railing, when Maddie's talking to Silver and she says, you can imagine how tempted I was to take that knife and put it in his hands and let him use it to his liking. When Roger says that Maddie can't imagine, and I just love, I love that again, or that he says you have no idea. She knows exactly what does. it is. Of course she does. And more than he and does. And the next thing she says, oh, of course she does more than he does. He doesn't know that he, <laughs> he's not seen Maddie the way That's we right. have, of course. Mm-hmm. But, but she says... Unlike Rogers, again, he's doing all this shit pretty much for his for own sake. Sure. Like we established, we established in the last episode with Soames that he Rogers is not taking the course that is the course for NASA. Again, everything he's doing, everyone who's dying right now is dying because of his vendetta. Mm, yes, yes. So Maddie says to Silver, "But where does that leave us?" She means if she gives in to her violent, her violent urges or her temptation. Sure. So I will fight this thing rising up in me, eager to see more blood spilled today, and I will serve them. Mm. She's such a queen. She's such a queen. I know. 
I know. I know. Maddie is the best of us. And I mean, except for Max, who's also kind of the best of us. Uh, Maddie has now reserved a- Max for me. Just saying. <laughs> I love that he says this to her. The I, I mean, the, everything he says basically is just so laced with irony in this whole conversation. But, but the irony of him saying that she has no idea what he's feeling, and when we saw her feeling the urge towards violence and and to restrain herself in the most noble way for the sake of her people and the larger goal. Mm. So that juxtaposition of two leaders, yes, one so true and good, and one so flawed and not good Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's very striking it's just the minute he said that that you have no idea i was like oh yeah she does and she's better and she's better than you yep uh yeah no she's uh yeah she's 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 the better person Mm -hmm. so when he says when he the point where we start hearing the knitting sorry i'm gonna i'm gonna be like super detaily about this scene because i just feel like Every choice was brilliant and moving and amazing and so full of meaning. So at the point where he says the man responsible for the death of my wife, that's when we start faintly hearing the knitting. Oh, my God. Wow. Wow. Yep. Right. And then he says, you're luckier than you know that I can still hear the faintest of voices in my head. Mm -hmm. And then he says, accept this treaty. And she interrupts him. She says, I will accept no treaty. And then he says... And John Silver lives. And he was so sure this was going to be the thing that changes her mind. And then he goes to our theme of this season, my God, Mm -hmm. this, this theme of who, you know, would it be enough? Could you live live living a life with someone? Camel sales. Yeah, I know. (laughs) Uh, Yep. Starting Hamel sales next week, guys. So he said, I believe that he's the one that you could live a life with with do not make my mistake again he just doesn't get her at all or anyone does he get anyone i mean he didn't get his wife clearly uh yeah yeah okay and then i have to quote her because maddie because she's this is an extraordinary speech it's so good yeah so can i can i quote maddie to you again liz will that make you happy (laughs) i can imagine the voice in your head because I know that Eleanor wanted those things. And then this again, this brings us back to the conversation she had with Eleanor yes. where Eleanor talked about it being enough. Mm-hmm. And when she says that, that's the moment when he looks over into the corner where the ghost of Eleanor is sitting. And then she says, I hear a chorus of voices, mm-hmm. multitudes. They reach back. Sen- I know. I'm, are you getting chills? I, I get chills so whenever good. I hear her so say good. this. <laughs> <laughs> and the knitting is getting louder as she's oh, saying God this. Damn. Yep. She says, they reach back centuries, men, women, children who lost their lives to men like you, who were put in chains by men like you. I must answer to them. I know. Chills yeah, everywhere. Yeah, no, it's so good. And then she says, their war, Flint's war my war and each time she says one of those things the knitting does a clack uh, for each one of those wars i know uh, i know i like yes. can't like like just i just want to like it's such yeah, a she thoughtfully done so show too on every level god <laughs> I know. yes she, yes yes and she says i won't i won't be bargained with to save john silver mm-hmm. or to save his men or to save my life. So I think we're pretty clear on where Maddie stands here on all yep. of this. Stuff. Yes, we are. And I mean, I don't think there was, there, there was ever any doubt, but she no, expressed no. it more eloquently than we could have. Yes, she definitely did. And I mean, even though they had the conversation where she said that Eleanor died fighting and so right. will I, I love that she, here she brings it to him, not just that he killed Eleanor, which again, at the end, she says, she said that, no, no one killed your wife, not Flint, not the Spaniard, that you mm-hmm. did. Oof. Yeah. And that's the moment when the knitting ends. Mm-hmm. And when he, when he has her taken away, mm-hmm. he looks over and Eleanor's ghost is not there anymore. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. I know. Right. And then again, back, I'm going to keep going to the anagrams. The idea, like her motivation, again, I love Flint. Yes. Flint is flawed. Yes. We've always had the argument, is Flint fighting for the sake of fighting? We know that an element of Flint's 
motivations, mm-hmm. despite the story he tells right. us, has always been vengeance, mm-hmm. has always been about, like, always been about Thomas yes. and then Miranda. Mm-hmm. Maddie doesn't have that. And I just want to go back to what Zaytu said in her interview, this this thing about that her parents knew knew the oppression of slavery firsthand but as a child who grew up in freedom she was in a way free to to be motivated outside of that not from the fear and yeah i just want to argue that you know yes is with all the similarities that maddie and flint have like she's the pure one her motives are pure her motives are freedom and the way to, i mean again and she carries the heavy crown so beautifully yeah. She, again, she's, uh, yeah, I'm, I, I'm losing, I'm, I'm incapable of words to talk about how much respect I have for this character. She is extraordinary. Absolutely. Well, in her place in history, I mean, this is, you know, just, she is the freedom fighter, but she's the true freedom fighter. Yes. She's the freedom fighter who's working from the motivation of righteousness, yes. of true righteousness. Mm-hmm. And again, in this room of a man who's like the, like, Flint in the extreme at this point, like the worst side of Flint Ah. in his extremes. Again, these parallels are not accidental. Mm -hmm. Also haunted by the ghost of of a woman who died as part of his plans. God, yes. So I just feel like the fact that she's calling this moment of her calling Rogers to account Mm -hmm. is her calling civilization to account. I completely agree. And it's beautiful. Yes. It's yeah, it's beautiful. And and it's terrifying, too. I mean, again, uh, she is making this clear that she is willing to go down this road no matter what the consequences are for herself and her loved right. ones Yeah, uh, because of the multitudes, the multitudes who are speaking to her about the injustice that had been done to them over centuries. <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> Very it's beautiful. It's beautifully um, done. Yes. Okay. Next we have silver and hands with the bodies of the three men mm-hmm. and, uh, Silver's angry. Yeah. <laughs> I should say so. Uh-huh. <laughs> and it's interesting what Han says, and he's, you know, this will relate also to his conversation with Flint, but he says, you know, you're angry now, but when he starts talking, yes. you won't have learned a thing. Again, this this theme of learning. Right. It's just, I don't know. It's just interesting that Hans like says, you know, how on the one side he says, you know, does Flint know how much you've learned from him? And on the other side, he says that you won't have learned a thing. Hans is such an interesting character because he's almost got this, uh, I don't know what the, what, what the role would be, but there's probably something closer to it in like mythology or something. And maybe you might know, but it reminds me almost of like this Jiminy Cricket sort of thing. Like it's almost the, eter- the internal monologue of silver learning that's just hmm. been set aside and given to this other character. Because I don't see Hans's right. personal right. motivations very well. I see him as an extension of the internal monologue of Silver. Hmm. That really works. Because, right, when Silver was wavering, he slapped yeah. him and said, be a king already. Yep. Huh. Interesting. Right. And do you see him now? Do you see it now, last yeah. episode? Yeah. And here, definitely. Ooh, let's hold on to that and talk about that at the fighting at the end. Okay, that's interesting. Certainly. Let's see how that relates to the both of them fighting oh, with Flint. Of course, sure, yeah. Interesting. Okay, so yeah, so we have the two of them talking and that, and then we get the flip side. We get Flint and Dooley talking, and Dooley's yeah. kind of like, also, he's like, you know, he's he's definitely Flint's puppy dog, and he's like, okay, I think I figured out your plan here. It's bigger than treasure. Uh huh. <laughs> Thanks, Dooley. You're cute. <laughs> and and he's yeah, he's like ah, silver. We don't need him anymore. Uh, And Flint's like, again, reinforcing what we see in this whole episode. Flint. Flint does love silver. Flint loves silver. It's that simple. And he wants silver part of this. Like, yeah. You know, one could argue that he doesn't necessarily need silver as much as he keeps saying he does. No. Yeah. I mean, again, uh, I loved his. For the sake of the war. Right. He He needs Maddie more than he needs silver for the sake of the war. Exactly. Exactly. And I loved I loved in the last episode, the whole you two are the world imbalance. Yes, and and I, yes. I agree, had this all worked out, and they did the revolution, and then he put Silver and Maddie in charge, yeah. that would have been pretty cool vision. But yeah, I love this. He says once, once she's safe, he will see clearly mm-hmm. again. I mean, this again, this is this is showing us that he really does want to save Maddie. Yeah, absolutely. He does. Because he's not saying it to Silver no. here. This is his plan. Mm-hmm. 
Um, so that's good. I mean, I felt like we, you know, that was, I, we needed that reassurance that, that Flint really yes. is not wavering here. Okay. And then we go back to memories. Mm. Well, and then we have Dooley saying, when the time comes, I'll do it. Oh, right. Yeah. Yep. And, oh, and Flint starts getting all twitchy yes, on us. Yes, he does. He twitches just a bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh hell y'all yeah mm-hmm. yeah exactly oh god i know flint in his flint in his in his non-poker face <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna talk about He's breaking my tell. heart some He's more gotta I'm, gonna, tell. I'm gonna twit i'm gonna twitch a little now <laughs> Uh-huh. Sorry, that sounds like I'm diminishing the power of of these of his facial expressions that like move me to no end and often to tears. Uh, <laughs> that's okay. We did call him Dimples McGraw. I guess you know it's, a, it's okay to throw a little levity in our into our discussion I of Flint so. because otherwise so. otherwise I would just be like a pool of tears all right. the time. Yeah. Okay. So so Silver starts the conversation in the next mem- bit of memories where he says there's no story to tell. Uh-huh. And he said, and Flint says, well, no one has a life that unremarkable. And he says, not unremarkable, but without relevance. And this is where we get a view into Silver's worldview, which mm-hmm. I guess just like his backstory, we never really had. Like we always knew how Flint saw other people. Right. And I, that was the moment I realized that, like the same way Flint realized he didn't have Silver's backstory. Mm-hmm. I realized that, you know, Silver talks about holding the world together with both right. hands. He talks about how other people relate to other people. You know, in the beginning, he talked about himself, but it was always in this, you know, kind of mercenary, I'm going to figure out, you know, how to get rich sort right. of way. Yeah. And in that self-deprecating way, like, I'm not a threat. But we never, we've never really heard how Silver looks at the world. Yeah. And so this is a pretty big deal for these two guys who, like, are totally partners now, we find out that their worldviews are so incredibly different. Walk, walk me through more of that. How you think that, <laughs> okay, I mean, okay. I, I found it so interesting to hear from Silver that he doesn't believe that your story has anything to tell you about yourself. Um, exactly. That he doesn't believe that there is a storyteller, which I don't necessarily know that Flint believes that there's a storyteller per se, but we can certainly see that he believes where you've that where you come from you know is is the wrist that holds the sword exactly and and that well and that things have to have meaning that that everything that has happened to him has to have meaning sure well he yeah. said something like that was that him i mean other characters have of course uh, i think of max saying this can't all have been for nothing right no i think flint definitely flint has told himself a story yes of of his tragedy and of Thomas's goals and pretty much everything he's doing in his mind is part of this story that he needed to continue what Thomas had set out to do and without that what does he have right. exactly yeah right mm-hmm. like he you know even you know the domesticity that he claimed he always wanted to have he never really took part in it you know, like we saw over and over again that he never really hung out in right. Miranda's house. Mm-hmm. I think that the story he has told himself about his own story is really all like that's the, possibly the most important thing to Flint. And what, what does Silver say here? He says, oh, right. He says that there's no need to. Right, he absolved himself of finding relevance in a way that defines him. And he said that the events of his life that no one could find meaning from them other than the world is unrelenting horror. God. Which I don't know about you, but for me, it makes me more interested in his backstory. Well, sure. More interested in his backstory, but also thinking that actually the version he told, it's interesting. Okay. But first of all, I want to bring up that horror is the same word he used with Flint in the last episode when he's saying what's, what happens next. Mm -hmm. Uh, So this ties into now a a thread of of silver uh, concerned i'm not sure what word to use but like having but seeing a world of horror yes. as a distinct possibility mm-hmm. and also the idea the idea that the only meaning that could come from hearing silver's backstory is that it is a world of unending horrors mm. 
completely shifted my idea of why Silver was never telling his backstory. Like I always saw him not telling his backstory as a tool, as a way to have something over other people because of, you know, because of early Silver, because of Grifter Silver, right? Okay, sure. And this interaction made me think that this is an explanation for Silver possibly being ashamed of his backstory, that his childhood perhaps was a million times worse than anything we ever imagined. And that he's just maybe on the opposite side of where Flint is just refuses to let himself be defined by it. He needs it to not have meaning. Exactly. It's going to, I mean, of course. Well, but in a way you could argue that it, it has had meaning. Like the fact that silver was so, you know, determined to be a loner always suggested to me that he had been hurt by people. I mean, that's often right. So there was always that, there was always that suggestion to mm-hmm. me, like people can become that thing in a lot of ways, but often it's because of hurt. And, and the idea of, of being in a, you know, a house for boys, yes. uh, you know, in an orphanage sure. in the 18th century already, already suggests know, like, pretty awful. yeah, yeah, you already know, like, yeah, th- things are not great. But the way he expresses it here, I feel like there is an aspect of shame, like, because he you can kind of feel like he want on some level, he wants to give Flint what he wants. You know, he's not being defiant. He's, he's in a lot of ways apologizing because he says at the end, uh, oh, he says, you know, all I can bear to be known. All I can bear right? to be known. Yeah, that does right. definitely suggest shame. Oh, and exactly. shame again is such a huge theme of the show. Exactly. And he says what he can bear to be known is his present is right. what he offers now, the genuine friendship and loyalty. But the idea that he can't bear to have known his past story, or even, you know, if he wants to not define it as a story, right. but, but the events of his past, sure. again, which he just called unrelenting horrors. Unrelenting <laughs> horrors that are irrelevant, which is, I mean, so... You right. can't have it exactly. both ways, honey. You yeah. can't have it both ways. So again, I feel like this gave us a window, even though it's a backstory that's not a backstory. And I am so amused with our interviewees. With Luke. Hi. Yeah. Uh, Hi. You and think you John. want that thing. Luke Might and John. not be what you want. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. You're right. It wasn't what I wanted. No. Um, mm. And but But in a way, that's beautiful, too, because it's like, our imaginations are pretty strong things. Yes. So if you give me a backstory that's too hard for Silver to relate, my imagination's going, my imagination at least, I don't know, maybe not everyone else's, but my imagination's going to go to all sorts of recesses mm. of the horrors of sure, the world sure. and fill in that Makes story for myself. Makes me that much happier than he's found Maddie. Right, mm. exactly. But I also feel like this explains a lot. So he started out, I started talking about this. He started out as a loner, mm-hmm. a decided loner. But then also, once he's offered community, the lengths he's willing to go for the sake of that community, when he finally finds a home, mm-hmm. that kind of starts to make sense too, right? And his, all of season three, his attempts to gain Flint's respect, to like, to have people to like it was like he you know he he went for it again like Billy went in extremes of good and bad he went in extremes also because if his childhood was so horrible and he was such a decided loner like it's like he didn't have the muscle memory to know how to do relationships Mm. even though he was really good at reading people which is something that you know that's a thing that abused children I mean again I don't know the backstory but like this is a thing that people who experience abuse know how to do really well Mm -hmm. let's say this could explain that as well like why he becomes so tied to people Mm -hmm. why he became so devoted to his crew why he became so devoted to Flint why he becomes so devoted to Maddie that suddenly he was offered a different way so so that's what I wanted to say about this (laughs) It's like my my heart is just simultaneously breaking for both of yeah, them. Yeah, of course. They would both be so much better. Well, we would all be so much better off if they didn't have this conflict that they're having in the present yes, time during this episode. Yes. And we get another beat of um, of whether or not something is enough. Can that be enough? And there still be trust between us. 
And we right. see really clearly on Flint's face that the answer to that is no. Oh my God, that's so true. He just asked Flint, will, it, will that be enough? And Flint didn't answer, but the, the not answering, I mean, to me, it pretty clearly meant no. And now we've seen that it means no. Right. And yet for most of, I mean, I feel like it's no, and yet he's willing to go past that because yes. in season four. Um, yes, he's still showing uh, absolute trust and loyalty in Silver, but he also, he can't be certain when it comes down to it that Silver is going right. to make you know, the quote unquote right call for the war and for Maddie because he's so blinded by his love for her. Sure, and sure, sure. Right. Flint doesn't know, like Flint knows how much his backstory, how much his baggage, I suppose, with Thomas and mm-hmm. with Miranda influences his actions and keeps him from seeing what is true, I suppose, uh, that he has to assume that Silver is going to be the same way because Silver has given him no reason to say, well, no, you know, I have a history of being able to see the light regardless of because et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So he had to leave room for, for Flint to, to guess. And Flint doesn't like that. Flint needs to be the one who is in control. Mm -hmm. And. Oh man. Yeah. It's rough. It's rough. (laughs) Okay. But let's talk, let's talk about Jack and Featherstone because that's our next scene. And and that's a lot easier to talk about. about. (laughs) All right, so we have Jack and Featherstone. Can I just say that I really was really excited to see Featherstone doing his yeah, thing. Yeah, me too. Like he's a navigator, yep. Yep. right? We haven't we haven't seen him be a navigator for so long, and it was just really fun to just see him. Like I don't know, having competence no, in, his actual, no. in his actual in his actual skill set. It was lovely. Bubbling Featherstone, which is cute, but it right. is nice to see him. Yeah, to, to see him doing well, yeah. owning it. Absolutely. Yep. Exactly. Yeah, that was that that gave me joy. Mm-hmm. I love their conversation. Like there's they're both so moved. It's really neat. Jack says, you know, this, you know, I remember when we were on our way to the Urca, like I was so exhilarated, but that this is oh, different yeah, because yeah. that was going to be a qualified victory. Mm-hmm. And he says, but but if we can prevail and he's like, uh, Jack is headed oh, towards like the the legendary status he has always wanted. It's within his reach. It's in his grasp. But again, like I said, it's like within his grasp, but like in a way that only Jack could have created. Yeah, it's no, different. It's, it's fantastic. He was always trying to be a different kind of pirate mm-hmm. than I think the kind of pirate. So it's like he also it's like Jack's also living within his competency yes. right now. Mm-hmm. Definitely. He's not trying to be vain right. or trying to be teach. He's trying to do something that Jack would do. Mm. Yep, that's good. Yeah, and I love it. And then Featherstone, like Featherstone's never giddy. He's kind of he giddy. He does. He looks really excited. I yeah, love no, it. They, they share a pretty beautiful moment. Yeah, I really loved it. And and Jack says a true victory, freedom in the true sense. How many men have known this? Mm. And I just want to go back real quickly to our whole thing about power threesomes. For anyone who's new to podcasts, go back to season two. We talk about this a lot. But back then, I suggested that like James, Miranda, and Thomas, Jack, Max, and Anne are a power threesome, where Anne is the pathos, yes. Jack is the logos, and Max is the ethos, the one that motivates everyone forward. And look at Jack being his best self, doing possibly the thing. And feeling so good yeah. about it. Mm-hmm. Right when he gets back into coalition with Max. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. That's good. I hadn't thought about that. Yep. I also want to bring up the library scene from 407. That moment when Jack saw Max talking about not having slaves and how it reminded him of Vain. Mm. Suddenly he's talking about freedom. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think part of his exhilaration is that he sees in Max a person who's smart like him, mm-hmm. but who values freedom, possibly like Vane. Interesting. Something that sure. he needed to learn, right? Because he had slaves and he mm-hmm. learned so much from Vane's reaction to it. Yeah. So I think that he might be a little bit inspired by doing this thing with Max. That's very interesting. I hadn't thought about that at all. Okay. I think that Jack might be, he might, he might be moving over to my camp when it comes to Max. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's the best camp. It's a pretty good camp. <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of good camps and there are a lot of good camps in Black Sails world. You know, 
some of them have stinky rotting meat in them. What was it that they, they, we ta- We joked about when 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 Teach was talking yeah. the smells of NASA. <laughs> but yeah, it's uh yeah, it's not a bad place to be. I think. I mean, you know, unless it gets Jack killed, and then then I might recant. <laughs> So we'll just have to see how that totally all works fair. out. Totally fair. <laughs> okay, but right when they're getting so excited because this is a Jack Rackham portion of the show, we all, we of course have to have comedy. Mm-hmm. And right, right right when they're both getting so excited, we find out that the old dude is uh-huh. dead. <laughs> <laughs> and I just was like, "Oh god, Jack." Damn it. Right. Damn it. <laughs> I just felt for him so much. <laughs> what do you say? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Let it be known that Jack can never have his hopes escalated without oh them also God. being deflated. So funny. <laughs> oh, it's so good. It's so bad. Poor, poor Jack. It. They have really know. found out exactly what to do with Jack Rackham in this season. I think oh he was goodness. on point season one. He's been on point season four. In the middle, we were doing different things with him, which I liked. I liked all of them. Um, yeah. But there there are a couple of just like perfect Jack moments. And now that I think that, uh, well, I, I don't know. There for a while when he was like high stakes gambling and doing the, uh, I have no notes. You know, that was, that was pretty yes. great too. But yeah, he's just, God, it's a solid well. character. I love him. <laughs> and the show wonderful. needs him yes. so much Desperately. because it is it just gets so heavy so the idea that they were like okay we're gonna let jack give us our brevity and our lightness and our humor is really really wonderful but never but but the beautiful thing is that he's but it's never it's never no hollow. it's, it's never, never just humor it's never yeah uh-uh. it always has meaning yes. and you know jack jack will break our hearts yeah. at the same time yeah, and that's definitely. what's beautiful about it it's just a different sort of you know you've got flint style heartbreak where it's like crashing against you and you can't help yourself and then you have jack style at heartbreak where your heart's breaking a little bit but you also have tears in your eyes because you're laughing right Mm -hmm. Right. (laughs) i love i love both styles of heartbreak but you know you need both of them agreed all right so then we have oh okay now your face (laughs) sorry so then we have i flip Well, I just flip pages and I see yeah. DeGroote, DeGroote and Joji DeGroote. and Julie no, on the I same know, page. I know. Yes, I know. <laughs> yeah, so Liz, get your glass ready because that's it. We've we've uh, hit the like holy moly. We need yeah. to just raise a glass over yeah. and over again right now. Okay. So first, so to the sweet old man who got back into the painting okay. and the swell of the sea. Yes, we hardly to knew you. He. Yes, we definitely <laughs> hardly knew you, old man. But we love you. <laughs> Okay. Right. Oh, okay. and we almost missed. I'm sorry. We were talking about the levity of Jack, but can I give a quick holler, a quick shout out to who plays Featherstone, the actor? I know that you know. Craig, Craig Jackson. Jackson for his blink, blink, blink. <laughs> because the bl- <laughs> I'm almost certain I know how to do this. And then all the blinking, just God, I loved it. it yes. Perfect. Yes. So cute. No, those two, like, those, yeah. The- God, I, I, need to not say anything about liking them together yeah because <laughs> we please don't we know, kill one we of know them. what i <laughs> both of them either way good god i need to not kill them with my love yes. <laughs> it's uh, not my fault i have no powers sure. i really don't uh-huh, uh-huh, i just uh-huh, i uh-huh. i have a sure. lot of love for pirates right. and pirates die as we're about to find out um okay so we have Gun and DeGroote. And I just, I don't know. I just really love this mm-hmm. thing about the ghosts and, you know, and and the irony that DeGroote says there are no monsters in the dark, but they're dangerous. Yes. Let's take care to tell the difference right when they're like setting the ship on I fire. I know. I know. And all this thing with monsters and men and civilization. And yes, no. Ah, uh, so much. Yep. It's so rich. Yes. Uh, okay, and then we have the fight with Joji God. that Flint, Flint and Dooley are moving that chest, and then we see Joe. And you knew, you knew it was yep. coming. Like yep. you know, Joji's you know. there. You knew this guy. And to be honest, because Flint doesn't necessarily need to survive for Treasure Island it's to true. be. It's true. Yep, he can just be right. He doesn't actually show up name. in Treasure it's Island. True. The fight with Joji. I really didn't know how that one was going to turn out. Can I also note that Joji with Dooley, like that he sticks his sword in his hand and leaves him alive? I mean, which yeah. is important for plot. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Uh-huh. 
No, but also important for like for brothers. Jewish. I mean, these yeah. two these two have been in this story from the beginning. Mm. They are brothers. Yeah. They have been on the same crew this whole right. time. So I really I really liked that Joji did that. Also, oh my god, we haven't talked about the sword noises. I mean, I talked about the knitting noises, but the sword noises. The I like, didn't notice this the time. Like, oh god, the like like vibrating metal awesome. noises when the sword. <gasps> So beautiful. Yeah. We haven't had that, I don't think. I feel like we haven't had that, or I just didn't notice it the same way as in this episode, and it's really gorgeous. This episode has a lot of fairy tale elements. I'm just thinking about this. It's like yeah, it following really the does. breadcrumbs through the woods, and yep. Uh, yeah, we talked well, about and the, the in power the woods, of names and stories. And in... Being in the woods, once you go into the woods, the rules change. Yeah. Uh not right. well and a haunted a haunted hauntings. Right, a haunted a haunted mythical island. Yes, I mean we yes, we are in yes. a liminal we're we are in a liminal state. We're in an island that doesn't exist yes. essentially because it's not on any chart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is all good. Damn, I love these creators. John Steinberg and Robert Levine. I will watch and podcast about anything and everything you do from now into eternity. Just let me know. Just let me know. <laughs> here for that also if you just want to like email me oh i was just doodling around at work and i made this little short story here for that too <laughs> did you hear that boys <laughs> liz made it liz made it a request both of our birthdays are coming up really soon Blow up my inbox april 6 for me april 7th yeah, for liz all those birthday buddies yeah by the way Right. So we have, yeah, I mean, and this is part of in Treasure Island too. I mean, Skeleton Island is that in the book of yeah. Treasure Island as yeah. well, that it is, you know, a place out of space and time mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Okay. So then we have the fight with Joji and Flint. I mean, did, did you know? I mean, I really went into going, holy shit, I don't know who's going to survive this fight. No, I think, yeah, no, I knew. I knew we were going to lose Joji and we we're going to keep Flint. Oh, yeah. really? You can't have the season I, finale without Flint. That's true. Okay, fine. You're yeah. right. Okay, or but, if you do, I'm pissed at you. Right. <laughs> okay, but suspension of disbelief is like one of my main oh, skills. Oh, okay, great. And so, <laughs> excellent. I'm glad that worked out so well for you. <laughs> I was super worried. Yeah. And and there's like when they're rolling down the hill and then they're like basically when Flint actually kills Jody, yeah. the way they did the camera angle, it's not 100% no, clear who, got who just Pierce yeah, too. it's true. Right. Was the second was like, okay, ah, that's ah, not ah, just ah. me. Yeah, no, you're totally right. right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'm really pleased that that wasn't just me. I was like, okay, is it just because I'm really bad no, at fight scenes? No, no, no. Or... I think they, they did that on purpose, yeah. Okay, so we must now raise a glass to for Joji. Joji. No last words, uh, just grunts. No last words. Uh, loved you, though. You were wonderful so and much. so fierce, and I loved seeing him fight. Excellent fighting style. Amazing, amazing. Yep. And yeah. if you have to go okay. down, going down by Flint... That's an honorable death, sir. You did your best. This is yep. true. And uh, we established in this episode that Flint is the best swordsman, except for maybe. <laughs> except for maybe. Except for... Oh, God. Oh, God. Okay, okay, it's fine. It's fine. I'm fine. It's fine. It's fine. Everyone, well, Flint and Silver both walk out of this episode. This much yes. we know. <laughs> or whatever. Sure. Stand I'm at so the top consoled. of the hill and watch their ship burn. Shut in up. I'm not ready for it. We're not Sorry. there yet, I know. Okay, we're not there yet. We're not, we're not there, there yet. yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, when Liz tells me we're not there yet. <laughs> okay, but first we have Flint and Hands. And... Well, first we have DeGroote saying abandon ship. Oh, right. Which was my first. Right. I already had heartache and heartbreak before the actual explosion you just mentioned. So, yes. Oh, God. Abandon ship just breaks yeah. my heart. It breaks yeah. my heart. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it does. So, yeah, Hands and yeah. Flint. Yeah, Hands and Flint. And I, you know... These guys really hate each other. And yeah, I like that Flint even was. Remember Flint, even when they were reunited, Flint was like, yeah, but what about that dude? I don't really want him. And Silver's like, eh. But Flint does put down his gun and says, for what's coming, I need everyone. Yes. And that means, I guess, you too, yep. if I have to. Um, and then they fight. And, you know, I love, especially in an episode that's so much about the art of sword fighting, I love how much Flint dominates Hands. Oh, yeah. And we've seen Hands dominate everyone, including Billy. Mm. Well, he is all like axes and power and fierceness. Right, and, exactly. Yeah. But, yeah, but Flint right. is and trained. He is trained. Right. Mm -hmm. He's doing that thing right. where he's thinking two steps uh -huh. ahead of the other person and watching the past and the present. Uh -huh. and yes. 
And right. And here, this is another moment of seeing the difference between a great thinker and a blunt instrument. Yes, absolutely. Sorry. Sorry, Hans. Oh, Hans I mean, is Hans is pretty savvy. A blunt instrument, though. No, he's pretty savvy in his manipulations of silver, but he's also a blunt instrument when it comes to fighting, for sure. Do you think he's manipulating I mean, I silver? Wouldn't... Oh, I think he has been all along, yes. For, to what end? To separate silver from flint. I remember but, when but he talked why? to flint and he's like... Just to be the right-hand man of the new king? Yep, I think so. Okay, sure. All right. I mean, again, no, that's good. Always, I need some I, kind of motivation for him because I'm always just like, no, I, I, that's what I keep saying. You see seeds of like, of Hans definitely sees himself as the protagonist of his sure. story and, and Kings as useful to him. Okay. That's how he talked about teach. That's no, how, that works. That totally and so works for me. having the two of them separate and him, the most important person to silver is like an awesome place to yeah. be. That's, he gets to go back to being what he was with teach. Yeah. Okay. Yep. That's good. That works for me. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's what he does. He just keeps throwing seeds in, mm -hmm. you know, and he did it with Flint also. The one time we see him talking to Flint, he's like putting seeds of doubt into Flint's mind. Mm -hmm. He definitely, you know, he said like, what happens when he doesn't, you know, when he has his own agenda, he doesn't care about right. you anymore. Yeah. I'm like, sure, that could just be a bitter dude saying, yeah, my, my dude, he, he ditched me and shot me in the face. But I don't think it was that. I think I think he's more savvy than mm -hmm. that. I think he was he's been he's been inserting little seeds of discord between them. Yeah. To the extent that he can. Yeah. No, I agree. Yep. Um so yeah, so Flint almost kills him and then Silver stops him and then we have this conversation and oh my god. This is fantastic. Yeah, I feel like back to to the past that can't be denied and the present that what did Flint said with the swords and the present that also must be or something right, like sure. that. I, that was just a few pages ago. No, that's all right. I can't remember the anyway, wording, even the though two I are in it. tandem. Yes. Um, but I feel like both of them are, are talking about their pasts and their presents. And I have one good example of that. So Flint says, I, I know you cannot see what must be. So this is addressing this, you know, I'm a big picture guy and you're not so right. much. And then Silver says, this is a partnership only as far as it serves you. It must happen your way on your terms. And I want to remind you of a thing he said in episode one of season two. Because, <laughs> you know, you know, I like to do Yeah, that no, that's thing. good. Okay. <laughs> So remember when they took the Spanish man of war and they had the whole thing, like they did their little, their little, you know, escapade, like their caper of getting the Spanish yes. man of war and silver endangers them by trying to grab that bosun's wh whistle. And then he wakes the guy up and Flint has to kill him yes. in the hammock. Yes. And then Flint's super mad because he thinks silver was just like trying to steal a random thing. And silver's like, no, no, this is a bosun's whistle. This is going to make what we're trying to do much right. easier. And then he says... We're both better off than we were two minutes ago, and you're angry because it didn't happen your way. Your way. Yeah, that's right. Interesting. Uh huh. So, what I find is interesting in this conversation, like this conversation could be looked at just as the conversation regarding the events of right yeah. now. But I feel like this whole conversation is actually one of those, you know, those moments when friends or a couple or, you know, people who are really tied to yeah. each other, they're talking about something, but they're actually like bringing up every, every beef they've ever had forever sure. and ever uh -huh. and ever. Yeah. You know yeah, what I mean? I so that's why I, that's why I wanted to do the callback to, to 201 Very is that I feel fight. like, yes. <laughs> Right. Well, and they're speaking, they're speaking in their past yes. as well as yes. in their present. They're, they're looking at two points at one time. Mm, that's smart. Um, so yeah, I just feel like that. So and then Flint says, oh, the stuff about Maddie, mm -hmm. which he's not wrong. Yeah. Definitely not mm -hmm. wrong. He says, you see that it's more you can see that it's more complicated than that. I'm sure that she does. Mm -hmm. Even if killing me helps you save her. How would you explain this to her? Mm -hmm. um, yep. Wow. And she, yeah, she believes in this as much as I do. And she says, if it costs a war to save her, you will have lost her anyway. Mm -hmm. so again, that's so goes, good. You will have lost her anyway. It's so true. If it costs this war to save her, you will have lost her anyway. He needed to hear that. He did need to hear that. And what I wanted to say is this goes back to Eurydice. This idea that, that Silver is trying to save his Eurydice and that that his it, that his panic that his not being you know his not being level headed about the way he's doing mm -hmm. it doesn't mean necessarily her death 
there are many ways to lose a sure, person. Sure, absolutely. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. So him as an Orpheus and her as a Eurydice would work that way as yes. well. That in his urgency to save her, he could lose her. Oh. Right. Again, that's not a prediction, not a prediction. everyone. I'm done. Heaven knows. I am, good God. Could be if anything. If I was... Yes. Ever, if I was ever out of the prediction business, I am so out of the prediction <laughs> business now. Sure. Not even half-hearted. Sure. I'm just talking about themes. Let's I just want. be clear. <laughs> <laughs> hey, really, I'm not predicting. Uh-huh. Just bringing up sure. themes and resonance. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. And then Flint says, even you cannot construct a story to make her forgive you mm-hmm. that. The losing of the war. Yeah. I love, I, mean, I love the recognition yeah. now that he's like, dude, I recognize that you, you are actually the best storyteller, like even you. Even you, yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, that would have to be a pretty good story because we just heard how important that war is to yes. her. Yes, yes. Yeah, no, there, there would be no way. While they're having this conversation, we're going back and forth. Yes. So that's the point where we go back and see finally that Silver is finally his match is learning and he gains the upper hand and then suddenly suddenly i'm afraid suddenly i don't know how this is go i i oh i right. just you i really don't, don't know right? what i want see you i don't know what i want oh. from this show right i mean right. I, well right. i want the two of them side by side i suppose is what i want right you want yeah. the two you want the two of them side by side with maddie and flint goes and I takes his word ever after oh god i'm never gonna get it am i <laughs> oh no uh, i don't know what to tell this you this can Sorry. only end in tears you down this road liz um yeah. <laughs> but yeah so simultaneously we see that silver has finally learned how to be flint's match in a sword fight mm-hmm. And then we see Flint shoot Dooley. Mm, that was gorgeous. It was so that was gorgeous. Beautiful. It was so gorgeous. And then God Silver just took advantage <sighs> of the situation. He oh, I know. Me. It broke my heart. Oh, and it broke my heart for Flint. And God, that was so beautifully constructed. That's, That's the moment we knew that there, Flint would not try to kill oh, him. God. That Flint would only fight defensively yes. in this sword fight. Oh, Which is not a good place to be no, in a sword fight no. when you know your opponent again. Like he said in the beginning, you insinuated in a way yourself in a way that it I would hesitate. hesitate. Yep, and now we know. Beautifully foreshadowed. All of it was beautifully foreshadowed. Yep. Right. God, this is a good episode. This might be a new favorite episode. My new favorite episode. It's, I know. I'm not it's this favorites. Se- Anybody know. who knows me well knows that I don't yeah. pick favorites well. That's not something. That no, I like, but it's. But yeah. It's. Well, this is hard because I said that about seven and then I said that about eight and now I'm saying it about nine. Oh, so yeah. I don't even know what to do with myself Who anymore. Knows? Could be anything. I give yep. up. You know what, Liz? Uh-huh. Black Sales is my favorite show. That I okay, can say. Okay, sure. Yeah, yeah. So you know what? It's all Fair good. Enough. <laughs> <laughs> no, but and then and then you hear the explosion and I, I just felt like that was so perfect also because... We've always talked about, and Silver's about to talk about, about the almost limitless possibilities of when they work together. Yes. And the moment that they are out of balance, that it breaks uh. down, is when everything falls apart. Now, of course, it's been falling apart and they weren't aware of it. But the moment that they are made aware of the world falling apart yes. is the moment when they actually were directly in conflict. Mm. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Yeah. Then we have... Uh, then we're in uh, Ben Gunn's POV, and this is gorgeous can, and horrifying. Okay, wait, we didn't raise a glass to Dooley, so raise a glass uh, to Dooley. Raise a glass See, it's to just Dooley. It's like super you busy. My it's hard favorite, work. But wow, wow, yeah, yeah. What a way sucks. to go. Sucks to be yeah. Dooley today. Yeah. yeah, he was just uh, trying to help. Hmm. Yep. Well, yeah, he was trying to become right hand man, but it's okay. Well, yeah, yeah, he was mostly yeah. trying to help. He also didn't want to see no, it, Flint die just then. Yeah. So, but right. yes. No, no, of course. It sucks to be shot by the guy who you're trying to save exactly. his life. Yeah, That's that no just fun. sucks. Yeah, I'm sorry, dude. What a way <laughs> to go. Like, right. <laughs> like, I got to shoot you because I like my other son better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Pretty much. <laughs> Okay, so then we have everyone in the water. Ugh, this is just brutal. I mean, it was a great plan. Mm-hmm. Great plan. Burn the ship yeah. and then come and shoot everyone. And they were just oh, yeah. fish I... in a barrel in that cove. Yeah. This was horrifying. Yep. 
Yeah, it's really horrifying. And it's uh, our Lucas Atlas episode uh, just came out right. this week. We talked about that Saving Private Ryan thing. That's what it was reminiscent of to me. Right. Yeah. Right. And he was talking about that about episode one of season yes. four. But this one, yeah, even more so Absolutely. for me. Just like, you know, it's just like, I mean, like what? DeGroote basically got shot mid-sentence, yes. didn't yes. he? Like he was, oh. yeah. Oh, so unceremonious, like degree. And he was our sh- he was our ship's master, master of ships. What do we call him? Yeah, he's been with us. He's been with us the whole. And I time. always loved him. I always wanted more Groot, which yeah. I got some. I got some more Groot. Oh, I think yeah. The last two episodes, you I got did. some good Groot. But yeah, it's just I know Praise it was just class. like really. This is how we're. I know Groot, man. Mm, Groot, you I'm so sorry. And ironically, Groot, when he was telling someone else not to be a pessimist. Oh yeah, Jeez. right. <laughs> he was finally like comforting someone else's worry. Oh God! Yeah. Yep. I know. I know. Right. So then we have again we have the present of the falling apart combined with mem with Silver's memories. Mm. We have them looking down on the burning ship while Silver remembers himself talking to Maddie, and he starts by saying, "Can't you see it?" Just like oh, Clint said at the right. beginning of the episode. Yes. Oh, God. Mm-hmm. I know. Yeah. So he's trying to explain to Maddie, like, remember, once upon a time, Maddie was the one who was suspicious of Flint. <laughs> it's hard to remember now, but she was suspicious of right. Flint and Silver was trying to convince uh-huh. her not to be. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. And so the fact that he starts with Can't You See It? I mean, again, this is very interesting. Like Silver's memory is basically is like what he said, that he has served Flint, mm-hmm. that he has a adopted Flint's way of being, Flint's way of looking at the world. On some level, it never has really been equal from Silver's perspective, I feel like. Like the way he's talking Mm -hmm. to Maddie is kind of like he's given me this thing. I mean, sympathy. I mean, the way he talks about the tragedy this man has endured, just, you know, his, the amount of of sympathy and caring he has for Flint there is something we've never right. seen. I mean, we've always known that he was loyal to Flint or tried, but the fact to see him speaking of his feelings towards Flint to Maddie was extremely mm-hmm. moving to me, but it's still, he's, he's basically like, okay, I've gained his friendship. So he gets mine right. too. So it didn't, it felt like it's, this is something I've won. This is not one. That's the wrong word, but something that was given to mm-hmm. me. It's still, it's less, it's not that it's not mutual either. It's that it was something for Flint to give, for Flint to make happen. Yes. Do you understand no, what I'm saying? No, I do. I, I love that. Um, I, I love that reciprocation. I have his friendship and so he is going to have mine. Like it's... Exactly. Um, th- this is something I, I, I've talked about before. Uh, I think we talked about it on our Mighty Fine Shindig uh, podcast where we talked about like when when one person offers up vulnerability and trust, it makes kind of an unconscious demand on the other person to offer that same level of trust and vulnerability. Not always, Mm -hmm. but it it is at Mm -hmm. least an invitation. And I think that Silver is responsive to that. It's surprising and only, and only goes to say, you know, what the horrors of his backstory must be that he, he doesn't give his own vulnerability back, but he does give, Trust and friendship. The trust and friendship, which is the same thing he said in the beginning, that that's what I can offer you and I hope it's enough. And I hope it can be enough, yeah. Mm. And then he says, as long as that is true, I cannot imagine what is possible while we look over the result of that not being true and everything falling apart. And that ship explosion. Can we talk for just a second about that ship explosion? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. God, that was beautifully done. Yeah, it, it was, was really so really done. beautifully done. Because uh, it could have been so, well, it could have been so Michael Bay. <laughs> but right. instead, you see it just, God, the shudder and the shake of yes, that ship. Exactly. I felt literal grief. Right. It's like a it character is. It is. It didn't feel like a set no. or a prop or... It didn't exist for the sake of the explosion. The explosion existed for the sake of the emotional right. impact of it. right. And and it was this connected. Their, this was, it was their home. Connected to all of the men in the water around it. It was, mm-hmm. I mean, that was all one unit. The ship and the men within it, and the life they had there, and their brotherhood together. God, yeah, no, that was gorgeous. Yep. So the moral of this story is: when parents give up their united front, 
all of your crew dies and your ship blows up. Damn, Daphne. <laughs> sorry, I shouldn't have yeah. said that. Yeah, we're being so emotional. Jeez, I'm sorry, Liz. Also, up until this point, I still thought they were going to give us a glimpse into Silver's actual backstory. I still thought he was going to give some of it up to Flint. Yeah. And they didn't. I was like, damn right. it, show. Are you kidding me? So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, you know, you cannot say you weren't one. It's warned. true. God. It's true. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. I know. I'm sorry that you don't get the backstory. I'm sorry that I was being flippant about burning ships. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> I have to do something. I mean, seriously, I just this this episode moved me a lot. I have to. I have to deflect somehow. Ready to guns. Full complement. All right, Liz, what's your favorite part? Oh, we need a favorite part. We really, we need favorite parts right I now. I know, but, oh, this is so hard. It was so gorgeous. I think, um, this is kind of cheating, but again, I'm not good with favorites, but I'm going to say okay. the silver memories are my favorite part. Okay. The way that was done, the get... music, the grayscale, the yep. everything about stories. That's my favorite part. Okay. Um, my favorite part is, well, I guess I can go a little broader than two. Okay, yes, you sure. Just, you just open that. Thank you for opening that door for By me. By all means. <laughs> um, I will choose the, the Maddie and Rogers, oh. including, and especially the knitting yes. needles noises, yes. but also Maddie's speech, which moves me it's beyond wonderful. really what I can yeah. say. All right, Liz, you ready? We have a really long list this time. Okay, I will do my best. I'll try to be sharp. <laughs> so our thesis that we decided on was the, I don't have the exact quote here, but the thing about no two people are close enough that they can't be divided. Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. Ish. Something like that. Right. Okay, so first person is Acorn Carla. Carla, our Portuguese, Portuguese man, man of war. war. Uh-huh. Carla is now a captain. Congratulations, Captain. You get a ship. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Oh, well, she and I have been talking vintage uh, vintage slips lately, actually. So let me see. What can I give her? Mmm. Let's see. Okay. So let's give her... Uh, can I give her the Marilyn? Sure. There, like Marilyn Monroe? She's going to get go. classic movie uh -huh. star ship names. I hope that's cool. That's awesome. Awesome. I was thinking Elizabeth Taylor, actually, but giving her the Elizabeth sounds a little bit, uh, <laughs> <laughs> a little bit odd. Since yeah, that's your name. Like, uh... <laughs> <laughs> so we'll do Marilyn. Marilyn Monroe. Mm -hmm. And the next is, oh, no, I've already forgotten. And she even clarified if it's Casey or Cassie. Oh, Casey, right? How's it spelled? Yes, because you wrote because you gave her the yes, I, whatever it was. C A S I E. Yeah, so I said Casey, and so I was right. I know yeah. that I was right, and I was right. Casey. So that must be it. Who is Casey Mordu? Has is now a quartermaster. Congratulations! Congratulations, quartermaster! Excellent. Okay, and the next is Kim at Flower Cottage. God, she has so many ships. Oh, I was just thinking of one for her too the other day when I was in the car. The blue bonnet. The blue mm -hmm. bonnet. Excellent. All right. And next is this is someone else who has a lot of ships, Emily Emerly. Stormy Morley. Stormy Morley. Hers are all over the place, right? Uh, hers are all over about. the place, which is good because she has more by a few than good anyone God. else. Okay, so you should name one then again, Daphne. Oh goodness. Okay. How about the Orion? Just Perfect. like just like Hornigold. Like <laughs> sure, she could have taken it from Hornigold, rat bastard. I love it. There we go. Mm -hmm. There we go. That's the story I want to have be with that. Okay, next is Jen at Great Chemistry. Yeah, red-handed Jen, uh-huh. Has the Squall, the Amazon Queen, the Minotaur, the Cerberus, the Theseus. Uh-huh. You gave someone else the Ariadne, didn't you? Oh, I must have. Yeah, that was the day that I was stuck in that. Yeah, I think I did. Let's give her the Eurydice. Okay, sure. That's, that's just me just hopeful thinking wishful that maybe thinking. the Eurydice will, wishful thinking that the Eurydice will be up for grabs. Right. Good God. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Next is Gypsy Book Nerd. Yes. Uh, which is Esmeralda Salt. Yes. Who has the Frollo and the Quasimodo. Oh, right. Yes. Uh, so we'll give her the Phoebus now. Okay. 
Next is Katie Bonner, who is Cat of Nine Tails. Yeah. And she has the cherry blossom. Let's give her the sequoia. Oh, the sequoia. That's great. Okay, sure. Hey, Katie, I named your Yeah, ship. beautifully uh, done, too. The sequoia. <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay, next is Here Be Megan. Uh huh. Which is Hawkeye to Gallant. It's a good pirate name, too. Every now and then I'm remembering. I'm like, know. oh, that's a good one. Sorry. And she is now a captain. Congratulations. So now she gets her first ship, Hawkeye to Gallon. Hawkeye reminds me of Avengers. You're going to get an Avengers-themed ship, Marvel ship. Okay. Oh, the Marvel. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Excellent. All right. And next is... is Oops. Uh, yeah, well, you know, I re- really, Liz, there was There was no never any doubt. This is kind of what for I For either of us. For either of us kind in of any way. Mm-hmm. Okay, the next is at Lucky Lady. Bad Penny Pembroke is now a bosun. Congratulations. Way to go. Congratulations. Woo-hoo. Uh, okay, next is at M the Beastie, mm-hmm. who is Cassandra McKillum. Cassandra McKillum, that's a good one, uh-huh. So she has one ship okay. now called the Triton. Oh, okay. Give that lady another ship. Uh, the Triton, okay. So then she'll get, um, uh, let's say the Neptune. All right. Okay. And next, at the Otis T, which the I now know <laughs> yes. how to pronounce that. <laughs> My favorite ever accidentally Black Sails related Twitter handle. Fantastic. <laughs> Twitter yes. handle ever. Uh, is now a bosun. Congratulations, Congratulations. my dear. And now you have to two new pirates. Oh, gosh. Two. two new pirates. That's exciting. Okay. Yep. Well, give yep. me something to work with. What are the Twitter handles I've got? Okay. At Katie Shuru. Okay, how about Bone Cracking Kate? Oh my goodness. Yeah. Love it. Okay, and the last one is at Quilly Cat. At Quilly Cat. <laughs> mm-hmm. Quilly Cat is exceptionally hard to turn into a pirate name. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Quilly Cat, sure. Okay, I want to call her Cougar. Okay, Cougar. I'm going for a more piratey style cat. <laughs> well, something a little more fierce. Yeah, so a fierce cat is a cougar. How about Cougar Calypso? I like it. All right, Liz. Well done. Woo! That was quite a list for you yep. to tackle. Need a drink after that. <laughs> All right. So, and next week, what we need to do is after you've listened to this episode, you will have until Thursday to give us the thesis statement for this episode. And then we will give out pirate names and prizes and ships you took next week for that. All right. Well, thanks again for joining us. Next week will be our last time we do a new episode of Black Sails. So until then, from Common Room Radio, I'm Liz Stevens. And I'm Daphne Olive. And don't worry, even though next week will be the last episode covering an episode or new episode of Black Sails, we do have ahead of us a bunch of interviews and some special episodes and analysis over the four seasons. So. We're all going to support each other. Uh Yeah, we're all going to support each other in this loss of beloved show through more fun and analysis. And definitely the interviews will be super Mm -hmm. fun for us and for you. That's right. Yeah. All right. Take care, everyone. See you next week. Deep is a Common Room Radio production. For more information and access to other programs, please visit us at commonroomradio.com. To show your support, pledges of as little as a dollar a month can be made to patreon.com slash commonroomradio. Join the conversation by using the hashtag FathomsDeep and follow us on Twitter at Black Salescast. We ask that you keep your tweets respectful and positive and please avoid spoilers. If you have more to say, we want to hear it in all its spoiler glory. Email us at podcast at commonroomradio.com with Fathoms Deep in the subject line. Thanks for listening. I know. That's that's it. Liz's love language is for me to quote Maddie. Mm. Happy to do it anytime, darling. Also take your blouse off. Um, No, 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 no. I meant your sweater. Sorry. I meant your sweater. (laughs) She really did. I don't I I don't I strip sweater layers. Not 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 completely. completely. Just the one layer. Let me be clear. (laughs) Thank you, Liz. Uh, Thank you, Liz. 
I think he lives. 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 <laughs>